Christopher Nolan. What an interesting legacy he's had. Something about him just clicked with so many, particularly once the one-two hit of The Dark Knight and Inception took over. Two films that just rocked the cultural zeitgeist and made the man an icon for many. Like it or not, he became the most popular modern director on the planet. The Spielberg for, well, my generation. And that sort of resulted in a bit of oversaturation and too much praise from the more pseudo-intellectual basic film crowd, for sure. If, like me, you went to film school in the 2010s, no one was a common fixture of lists of favorite directors to a point of almost parody. Like Tarantino before him and Edgar Wright after him, it became very easy for some to curse Nolan based solely on the inflated fan base he had acquired of those who hadn't seen much beyond him. But was that hate deserved? In my opinion, no. You see the greatest filmmaker to ever live? Certainly not in my opinion, but barely anyone is. What he is, is damn good. Even Zack Snyder, who, as much as I may not be a fan, does have a pretty big fan base, cannot compare to the level of fame and success Nolan has had. And that should say something. The Spielberg comparison may appall some of you, but it's hard to not see it. A man with certifiable credentials, whose films were smash successes at the box office and attracted fans, to a point that his name became known by most humans who don't even care that much about movies. And I have my own personal connection to him. I've mentioned before that the reason I got into films was seeing the Dark Knight trilogy as a teenager. It was one of the first times I watched a movie and truly got what I now love out of it. Sure, Batman Begins can be a bit bare bones comparatively, and The Dark Knight Rises is a fucking mess. Like, Jesus, Bane is carried by Tom Hardy's performance because there really is nothing to him. But in The Dark Knight, I saw subtext that I hadn't really allowed myself to read into before. I found something I could dig into, and I truly got it and realized what I loved in film and as a result, dove into the medium. And there remains a favorite film of mine to this day. Maybe not as high as it used to be, but still very beloved, with it also being a part of what I consider Nolan's golden tier of films. With the complex heart of Inception, the search for perfection in every step of the prestige, and what's, in my eyes, his masterpiece, Memento. So I've kept track of him ever since checking in every once in a while, and I've generally liked everything he's made. Well, except for Tenet. Tenet was pretty mediocre in my opinion. Kind of hollow beyond the set pieces, sadly. But as a result, I was of course interested in seeing where his latest would take him. I went and I saw that film on 70mm. I wanted all of that 11 mile IMAX film roll. And let me tell you, we got his best film in about a decade. The first thing you'll notice when watching Oppenheimer is the beauty of how its score entangles itself into the story. Early on, they established music as a metaphor for the work of theoretical science, and they put that to use. While Christopher Nolan's mainstay of Hans Zimmer is not here, as just like Tenet, he's too busy working on the new Dune film, his protege of Ludwig Göransson returns. And just like Tenet, I feel like he hits the mark extremely well. Though unlike Tenet, there is no Travis Scott song for this one. <laughs> the soundtrack focuses on building tension. Rapid fire, string raises, electronic skittering, sweeping beauty for the moments we see the beauty that Oppenheimer sees. It feels like the driving pulse of the film, and like an excellent bow tying it all together. The directing is of course phenomenal. It's rare you're going to see me critique Nolan's sense of visual flair. His dark shadowing, use of wides, expert blocking, depth of field, all of it is to be expected. Though a unique thing to this film that is a rarity for Nolan is a lot more metaphorical imagery. We see a great deal of the film from Oppenheimer's perspective and thus see his anxieties manifest visually. It leads to us as the audience truly getting the character of J. Robert Oppenheimer, faults and all. And this ensemble, holy shit, no one has had some incredible ensembles in his career. But this is one of his most impressive yet. I mean, Rami Malek, Casey Affleck, Tim Conti, and Dane DeHaan play extremely minor roles in the film, and yet remain incredibly memorable in spite of that. Add in cast members like Alden Ehrenreich, Florence Pugh, Emily Blunt, Gary Oldman, Josh Hartnett. Hell, Josh Peck is even in this. Actually, early critique, we do not hear Josh Peck say Kenneth Bainbridge's famous line. Megan! 
Now we're all sons of bitches. Oh, jeez. You're a fucking lying son of a bitch, Sam. And I hope you fucking go to hell. But that's not even getting to the stars of this film. First off, what might be my favorite performance of the film, Benny Safdie. We should all know his and his brother's directing work now. But with his latest performances in Licorice Pizza and Stars at Noon really wowing me, he's proven he can do more than just star in his own work. And dear god, this is probably his best yet. He manages to put so much character into every line delivery, it felt like I really knew the man personally. And he's not the only supporting cast member impressing here. Jason Clark is fantastic and incredibly imposing to a degree that I think he's the most unsung and vicious performance of the film. Matt Damon really grabbed onto his character, highlighting this terrifyingly militaristic character that seemingly lightens up on Oppenheimer and his scientists towards the end, but with the knowledge that he will always play his war credentials first, creating another notch in his history of great performances. And of course, there's all the hype surrounding Robert Downey Jr.'s performance, with him arguing this is his true return to form since being Iron Man, even saying this was the best film he's ever been in, which... Are you okay? No. Thank you for asking. I mean, that's a hard one to beat. But they are right, he does do a good job in the role. Admittedly, I don't think it's quite as amazing as others. I do think he has better performances out there, but he pulls a subtly scheming persona into the screen. Guy who radiates the oily charm of the used car salesman branch of dirty politicking. And of course, there's the man himself, Killian Murphy, who I'd argue also has an argument with Benny for being the best performance in the film. Chillingly honest in his arrogance, his growing anxieties, and showing a man so stretched to his limits he doesn't even know where he stands or who he even is anymore. For a film that focuses so much on J. Robert Oppenheimer, you'd think the level of vulnerability would provide for some holes in the performance. After all, it is three hours of total absorption into the man. That's a long time to be on your A-game. And yet, no, he's always doing incredible. Currently my pick for best actor so far. Though obviously, it's still pretty early in that race. And writing isn't a slouch either. There were a lot of fears I saw from some early on that this film was gonna overly venerate the Manhattan Project, turn it into some victory lap of sorts. But no, it seemingly always keeps in the back of its mind that what they are working on will end the world. There's certainly a level of play between the scientific ideal of apoliticality and getting the job done, in contrast with a world that will take said scientific achievements and use them as they please. It's said against the Red Scare of the 40s and 50s, it's not hard to see why that comes into play. In a certain way, the film manages to show how each character gets wrapped up in it. The feverish hatred of the Nazis that then either melts away or increases as it becomes clear the bomb will never touch Hitler. There's also a certain level of dialogue, tit for tat, that is absolutely addicting and tense to see witness, even if occasionally it can get a bit on the nose. Like, I feel like Oppenheimer did not just happen to read the I am become death destroyer of worlds quote right after sex. And yet, even that flexing of the truth works in its favor sometimes, like Truman describing Oppenheimer as a crybaby or the chilling final line that is specifically from a conversation no one will have ever heard. That said, I do get some worries that this film is disrespectful in a way to the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Like, I personally think the portrayals of figures responsible for horrifying events are still worth exploring. But seeing as how I, as a white American, am not directly affected by said tragedy, and that this is a movie that is generally sympathetic to Oppenheimer's guilt while still critiquing him, I get how some may be disgusted. Though I do think the film's decision to not show the bombing itself was a smart one. It would have been bad taste for sure. But still, I do see how this film is a bit softer on Oppenheimer than he may deserve, considering the hundreds of thousands of deaths he never apologized for at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But I do think his portrayal is mostly well handled, and that portraying a film from his perspective is not inherently dangerous in concept, but I can understand the opposing opinion as well. In the meantime, as people bring up that there needs to be more representation for Japanese victims of the atom bomb, 
I rarely see people discuss the actual Japanese films about those topics. If you want some, check out the late Nobuhiko Obayashi's War Trilogy and Labyrinth of Cinema, as he's an excellent filmmaker whose relationship with Hiroshima I've discussed before in my house video essay. Not to mention Godzilla and its metaphorical representation of the vicious attack. And any self-respecting person will become full-on nuclear arms abolitionist with one look at Barefoot Gen's harrowing bomb scene. While I'm talking about possible gripes, I kind of got to discuss the most obvious one for me personally. The film can have some pacing issues. Don't get me wrong, I'm not someone who can't handle a good three hour film. It's just that the opening 40 or so minutes prior to Oppenheimer joining the project can have some scenes feeling like they're being rushed through, as if they're afterthoughts leaving me to believe that even Nolan thought they were drags, and at that point, I think why even include them besides referencing them later. And while I do enjoy the later third after Oppie leaves Los Alamos, it can have some scenes get a bit long in the tooth, as the trial sequences can get a bit repetitive at points. And if you're curious, I did slightly prefer Barbie, to be honest. That's just... They're both great, but I, I prefer Barbie a little bit. But it's hard to deny that this is one of the most expressive films Nolan has ever made. And while I would put it right below the golden tier of Nolan's works I mentioned earlier, it's the closest any film outside of it has gotten, nailing itself as easily one of the best of the year. Chilling, thought-provoking, utterly visceral, and tense as all hell, Nolan has created one of the most shocking historical dramas in recent memory. Maybe it'll help us realize that with the creation of that weapon, we may have already ended the world. Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer gets an 8 out of 10.